Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the conversation about farm solar. Um, we are going to have a town hall style event this evening. This is part of a series of meetings that Council President Sidney Katz, myself, uh, and the council are convening to conduct additional stakeholder engagement um, and to bring together uh, different voices and see what might come of that. Um, very pleased that we're joined. We have over 100 participants now in the Zoom, and we have uh, many council members. Because of our open meetings rules, um, most council members will be observing rather than engaging in dialogue um, because it can't be a meeting of the county council where we conduct business. However, their council members are are here to observe. So council president and I will co-chair this meeting, although most of the meeting will just be hearing from you. And then council member Friedson, council member Albernos, council member Hucker, council member Glass are here. Um, and they are very, we're, we're very glad they're here. So uh, with that, council president Sidney Katz. Thank you, uh, Hans. And, and thank you everyone for being here this evening. It's this this is a process that we that all the council uh, realized that we needed an additional step to it. And Hans and I, and let me very publicly thank Hans, uh, council member, uh, and uh, the, the the council member uh, Reamer, that that um, when he and I first talked, we were not on the same wavelength on this, and 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 uh, I I thought that we needed additional discussion, and and so did he, but we couldn't exactly get together on how it should be done. But because of that, we had a good open conversation. And let me thank Tommy Haber from, from, uh, from uh, Council Member Reamer's office as well. Uh, but because of Tommy and, and, and Laurie Edberg from my office and, and Lisa Mandel Trupp and Ken Silverstein from, from Hans's office, we started just chatting with the other council members individually. And we came up with the idea that maybe a town hall meeting is what we need to do. I met with, I've met with people on all sides. I know all the council has, but I met with people on all sides on this. And, and I, and I realized that there, everybody has the same goal to get more solar. The question is, how do we get it? And how is it going to be effective? And what are we affecting while we're doing it? So the idea being that we want, not only do we want you to talk to us, I mean, we want to hear from you and we certainly, that's important, but we want you to talk to each other. We, we believe that people on different thoughts, uh, who, who have a different thought on these topics, if you'll actually talk to each other and, and, and try to, 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 to figure out what's, what each of you was saying, then maybe you can come up with the best solution we can possibly come up with, have even more solar than what we could have had, and uh, not cause the same excitement that we were causing up to now. The, the bottom line on this is that we want to have this come back, and I think January was the, was the end date. Uh, we have holidays in the middle of this, so we're not going to have you know, all of these meetings. I, I would like to have a work group. I'd like you to each have these discussions amongst yourself and with us. We're going to have at least, uh, Hans, I guess we figured three different meetings on this. Uh, and, and please, if you have, when you have your discussions and, and, and please send in your emails and other uh, materials so that we can hear from you. You don't necessarily have to speak just here for us to hear from you. We want to hear from you in all ways. And so with that, we're going to thank our good friend, Susan Kennedy, who's going to be uh, calling on people this evening. She's, she certainly has done this in many, many other venues and she does a great job. See her, we see her all the time. We saw her this afternoon. So with that, Susan, if you could please take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Good to see everybody again. Our first question this evening uh, will be from Jeremy Chris. So Mr. Chris, you may start your video and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy Chris, Office of Agriculture. I just simply wanted to say thank you to the council for providing this opportunity for the town hall, uh, slowing the ZTA down so that we can have more dialogue and definitely the working group, but uh, we look forward, the agricultural community looks forward to participating. 
Um, the agricultural community remains unanimously opposed to the ZTA. And what I have prepared from the Office of Agriculture is a list of agricultural thoughts. This was a list of suggestions, concerns, and possible amendments that should be put on the table for further conversation and discussion. And so we're looking forward to going through those ag thoughts. Again, they came from the Office of Agriculture because we, the agricultural groups uh, are opposed to it. Uh, we know that there are many landowners in the ag reserve that are interested in this solar policy. Uh, we are not sure if there are any farmers, actual farmers that are in support of it. Uh, the only thing that I would like to address or at least raise is, is there a way that we can look at the total of 18 on 1800 acres that's proposed for siting solar in the AR zone and to consider phasing that in over a period of time, maybe over three to five year intervals to evaluate how it's working and to look at each phase lessons we've learned in that phase or some of the unintended consequences that we've learned and then perhaps address those before we go to the next phase. Uh, Mr. Council President, do you, I guess, uh, shall we respond to if, particular if we, questions? Yeah, if we can, why don't, yeah, yeah. why not? Square, uh, uh, okay, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for your very thoughtful engagement along the way uh you've been at the table with us at every conversation uh we've had three or four committee meetings public hearings uh council work sessions and um i have a, i have at every moment appreciated your uh your very grounded um and deliberative approach to this and i and i recognize what you're what you're saying that the you know the, the organizations that bring together uh producers or farmers are, are not in support um, so thank you for the suggestion about phasing. And uh, I think that has certainly been a, an issue that we have talked about and uh, we'll, we'll make a note, make a note of that as well. I, I, thank you. Thank you. And let me just add to, to Jeremy, thank you. As, as, and let me just uh, uh, say ditto to what Hans just said. But I also think that we, we need to uh, mention that everything should be considered. Any any suggestion anybody has, we should consider it. And, and then we can, uh, you know, evaluate it and figure out what is and what, what, what could work and what might not work. But we should consider every, uh, every suggestion. And because that's what this is all about. That's what this town hall and the other meetings would all be about. But I think that's a good suggestion as well. Okay, um, before we go to the next question, I see some folks uh, who are attendees who have their hands raised. So if you do have your hand up and you have a question, please go ahead and send it to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we will try to get to your question in, in a little bit here. So feel free to type that in for us. And our next question this evening comes from Alfred, Alfred Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett, you can unmute yourself and begin. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so I wasn't aware in advance of the format. So, but for me, I'm um, speaking with Sierra Club. Um, I guess the overall question is how does the county uh, build the solar that it needs that will serve all of us um, in the future? And uh, that comes because as a conservation organization, you know, we have common cause with farmers. Farmers are some of our best partners caring for the environment but we're also committed to fighting climate change, which affects everyone, including farmers. Um, and we'd all like many things not to change, except maybe for the election to be over. Um, but the reality is the world's changing around us. Uh, during the 40 years that the Ag Reserve was established, global temperatures have already increased by almost one degree uh, centigrade, or Celsius rather. Um, and electricity generation is the second biggest source of fossil fuel pollution that's driving climate change. And as we electrify other sectors like transportation, they'll only get more important. So it's also the one where we can get off fossil fuels. Montgomery County isn't likely to have wind farms. We don't have a coastline. So solar has got to be a key part of our future. So this is the question, where can the solar go? 
we totally agree that we need to build as much solar as we can on rooftops and parking lots. At 100% clean renewable energy, we need at least 2,500 megawatts of solar. Right now, we only have about 100. Uh, we also know from LIDAR surveys done by DOE and by the county's own separate assessment, we can only build about half the solar we need on rooftops. And importantly, solar on rooftops and parking lots only serves the owners of the parking lot or the rooftop. Uh, it doesn't provide electricity for roughly three quarters of folks in the county that can't have solar on their roof. Uh, the solar rays that serve multiple homes and businesses are just too big to be built on rooftops. They need to be built on the ground. And that's where community solar projects come in, small projects that can serve several hundred households. Uh, the reality is the only place ground-based solar can be built in our county is on agricultural land. There are no buildable brownfield sites in the county. There are only two landfills, and the county's already building solar uh, on the big one, Goody. Um, and the Dickerson Power Plant site can maybe take 60 megawatts of solar, but that's far from the 2,500 we need. The issue is that other counties have faced the same challenge. The neighbors in Frederick and Howard and Prince George's counties have all managed to find ways to allow solar development on limited amounts of agricultural land. But here in our county, the fact that almost all our, our ag land is in the reserve has made an even more challenging discussion. So we've worked hard with the council. Uh, we believe the ballast that the ZTA represents is appropriate. Small amount of land, 1.9% of the reserve's 93,000 acres. Solid protections for streams, forests, wetlands, topsoil, and other resources. Uh, and, and a guarantee that every solar project will actually be beneficial to agriculture. So there's a lot more to talk about, but we keep coming back to the basic question. If we don't build solar on ag land, how do we meet the clean energy needs that we have going forward? Um, well, let me... I, I, I don't want to take a whole lot of time answering every question because I, we want to hear from as many people as we can. But let me just say very quickly that, you know, I don't understand why we're not, why more and more parking lots, and I talk about Montgomery Mall or, or other parking lots, why we're not having solar there. I've spoken to the solar industry. And then, of course, they, it comes down to price in some cases for the, how much it would cost to lease the land. And, and, if that's one of the reasons, then perhaps we have to figure out whether there could be credits for the property owners there, uh, whether or not there could be uh, some subsidies for property owners there. The, the, the property owner would be getting something in addition to the parking lot that they now have as an additional income because of it. I think that we need to have those good open conversations, but just to say that that it should only be in in in, uh, in the ag land, which Montgomery County is very proud of the fact that we have an ag reserve. Uh, I think that that's something that we need to have these discussions, and so that's why one of the reasons we said that we need them and more. We need to have this conversation so that we can be uh, listening to to what others have said and why they why things are and aren't working. But to me, I've I've been in parking lots and. Where the doctor's office that I go to, they have solar over top their parking lot. So I, I think those are possibilities. Yeah. Mr. Can I just respond? Because yeah. I, I think I was clear in saying that we support building solar on parking lots and rooftops as much as it can. The problem being that two, one, it won't meet. Uh, it it only meets the needs of the of the shopping center or of the house where the array is. It it doesn't export power out to the rest of the community. To do that, you need larger uh, arrays. And the other issue is that um, the uh, cost is, I understand that maybe incentives and things are would be helpful, but right now in our revenue situation and so on, revenue, it's gonna be hard to provide a lot of incentives, either reducing revenue or actually paying out money. Whereas uh, the, um, investment that's being made by solar developers under the community solar program is a private sector investment. Um, and that actually expands our solar. But the solar that serves multiple families or multiple businesses is just different from the rooftop and the parking lot solar, which so serves the owners, basically. Well, I don't know why they couldn't go beyond that. I'm, we, we probably shouldn't uh, debate it right this moment, but I don't know why they couldn't go beyond that. And you're talking about credits. That would be areas that we are not getting taxes on now that we could give some credit to the to the uh, properties. I think all of that needs to be looked into. 
Oh, I agree. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question is Franny Yuhas. Ms. Yuhas, you can uh, turn on your video and ask your question. Well, uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, I, I don't really so much have a question as I would like to pick up on some of the comments that were that have been made uh, thus far. Um, so my name is Francis Yuhas. Um, I'm a lifelong member of Maryland uh, and have been working in the solar industry uh, since 2005. Um, I'm a project manager representing Turning Point Energy. I'm a board member of MDVCA, um, the Maryland DC Virginia Solar Energy Industry Association and a co-chair for the Coalition for Community Solar Access in Maryland. Council Member Katz, we would certainly like to continue the discussion with regard to your comment about incentivizing projects to be placed on parking lots and other rooftops You know, at the appropriate time. I heard you loud and clear that maybe we don't debate it now, but we'd like to continue that conversation. I have my own 3.2 kilowatt um, PV system on, uh, on my roof that's been operating flawlessly for the past 15 years. I joined the solar industry in its infancy back in 2005 because I sincerely believe uh, that renewable energy is a wise investment and will greatly support initiatives to maintain or, or to minimize and ultimately reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I know there will be others you know, speaking about that uh, this evening, I'm sure. But it's my understanding, and I think um, Mr. Bartlett uh, or Dr. Bartlett referred to this, that there's currently only about 110 megawatts of solar generating systems in the county, um, now mainly on rooftops. So it's going to take a long time to get where we need to be without building solar projects on the ground. You know, I've personally taken actions with considerable personal investment to do what I can as an individual to reduce greenhouse gases um, by having my own rooftop uh, system. But imagine what we could do, you know, by employing the advantages of the economies of scale by building community solar projects that will allow, you know, all electricity users to participate in the clean energy economy. And, you know, several people have talked about that. So, you know, we've been successful in developing community solar projects in years one and two. Um, so I guess I would just like to highlight a few important aspects of the renewable energy landscape in Maryland. Um, and solar energy in particular, and why the ZTA actually complements um, these initiatives. So um, obviously the ZTA, as we're talking about, would allow facilities in the agricultural reserve zone that would actually benefit county residents who use the electricity, county government who will reap benefits from the uh, personal property taxes that will be uh, gained from the system as, as well as the state. And I believe, um, you know, We've already heard that community solar projects are designed to make solar energy available to everyone who cannot access solar on their own by installing it on their own roof or, or in their in their yard. So, you know, solar projects in particular, as defined by community solar in Comar, have very specific siting requirements. Maryland law dictates that and, and limits that community solar projects um, can be no larger than two megawatts in capacity. Um, that equates to about 15 to 20 acres per project. They cannot be placed on adjacent parcels. Um, also, there are inherent and natural barriers that restrict the location of projects. Topography, viable interconnection points, um, presence of wetlands and floodways also limit the locations where community solar projects can be situated. Also, a parcel shape, orientation, means of access um, also qualify or disqualify a site. So once the ideal site has been identified, then the landowner has to be, um, you know, willing to actually lease the property to host, host that solar array. So with regard to the restriction that solar arrays um, would not be allowed to occupy parcels of land located in prime agricultural soils, and I know this is a hot topic, um, and, and particularly the, the class one and two soils, this requirement would even further limit the number of properties that would be available to consider um, to be considered under the ZTA. So, you know, exa hindering exactly what we're trying to overcome, and that is to finding available sites for these projects. So um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, there are already natural limitations associated with um, siting these projects, um, allowing projects in the agricultural reserve 
um, I, you know, to Dr. Bartlett's point, you know, will get us to the goal that we need to be there because honestly, we have come to the county. There are no other available sites um, for solar. And um, I think my colleagues in the industry, you know, are, are with me on that. And I certainly list, uh, look forward to listening to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank Our you. next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Hans. I was just going to observe. Uh, thank you, Franny. Um, we'll take questions or comments. We really, I think, more anticipated that folks would be speaking their their views. This is more a forum for for you tonight, you know, and uh, occasionally it may be necessary to respond or to answer. But our tradition at the county council with uh, public hearings, for example, is that council members generally hang back and let the public have the have the time to to speak. So. Um, I, th I think that's generally a good approach, and uh, I may limit my comments generally unless there's something I feel that I just have to answer. Thank you. And, and if, let me just very quickly, it's and we're double checking this. We're not sure what time we have to end the Zoom call, so we're double checking. So we might have to put a time limit. As much as we want to hear from everybody as best we can, we want to hear from everyone is uh, that, that's on the call if possible of course you can also send it in so we're double checking that yes and uh, the folks who are have their questions typed into the Q&A or their comments question those will be addressed if you don't if those don't get asked on the air tonight so we will be addressing those so our next person up to speak is Randy Stabler Mr. Stabler you may unmute yourself and start your video and, and begin your talk I don't see him. Yeah, I see him, but Randy, you're on mute. Oh, okay, there he is. How about now? Yeah, I got you. Okay. <laughs> I I was saying thank you very much, Council President, and uh, the members of the T&E Committee and the Fed Committee and all the Council as a whole. Uh, <laughs> of course, as you can see right there, me not being able to unmute uh, <laughs> as I'm trying to participate in this, I have stopped the combine and I'm in the middle of a field. So um, we appreciate uh, the fact that you all are, are given some more time to, uh, to uh, vet this CTA and gather some more information. And uh, those of us in agriculture and in the ag community and landowners uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in it some more. So I just want to say thank you to that. Um, I, my, my comments are very short tonight, and I I'm really appreciate listening to all the other comments, hoping to learn some more as well. But uh, I think it's going to be important that uh, that all of the information gets put up on the table and, and, and discussed, and hopefully this working group can uh, function and go forward and some more will come out of it, and uh, maybe some things can uh, be moved to more middle ground or something. But uh, at this point in time, um, this is very troubling for the ag community, the, the very viability of agriculture competing against us and for a resource that we're needing and that being the land. And so um, at this juncture, the, the ag community remains uh, opposed to the ZTA, but we look forward to communicating further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stabler. Our next speaker is Joyce Briner. Ms. Briner, you may begin. Hi, um, I'm Joyce Briner. I'm executive director of a nonprofit called Poolsville Green. We're based in Poolsville. Uh, I'm a climate change uh, professional uh, as designate, designated by the uh, state of Maryland. Uh, I have rooftop solar, 16.6 .6 megawatts worth. Uh, which powers 100% of my electric usage in the household and, and electric vehicles that uh, the household has, supports. Um, and um, I'm very much in favor of the ZTA. Uh, and I, I want to stress that my position is that it's very important that uh, where possible climate, uh, climate change um, uh, benefits or climate, you know, things that address climate change get stacked. The, 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 
the, it, we work to stack that. So on one hand, we might have uh, regenerative agriculture techniques. On the other hand, we have community solar. Why not marry those two? That's my position. Uh, that I feel very strongly about that. We're running out of time. We're out of time. We're not running. We're already out of time when it comes to dealing with the issue of climate change. It is, it is just, uh, if you don't think it's impacting the world today, okay, let me, let me talk to you offline about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we need to get on the ball, you know, how many people have been installing solar? We had a solar a co-op here in the county uh, this year, as we have the last four years or so. And about 200 of families across the county signed up for that. Now, not all of those put rooftop solar on because of various problems that they end up choosing not to do it. But uh, that was the goal. If we're only going to put, you know, 200 or 500 roofs on a year, we'll never get to dealing with the climate issue with regards to addressing the needs for renewables in the county. Uh, so let me go back to that uh, that stacking of uh, climate benefits with renewables and things like regenerative agriculture. Uh, I think I, I think we really need to re look at that more. The research I spent a few days on an international conference a couple of weeks ago on agrivoltaics. Uh, I hope that some of the area uh, and regional farmers that are aware of this issue are also a part of that. Uh, there's a lot to be learned. Uh, it's not all pie in the sky stuff. Uh, at a bit, at a very minimum, you can do uh, pollinator friendly habitat, which supports the uh, farm fields around the array. Um, and I don't, you know, the array, we're not, it's not like they're looking to take over the whole ag reserve. It's like one or 2%. Uh, and that's, I think that's very a notable restriction uh, on, on that, on that. Um, I think, uh, I, th I think the other part I'd like to really um, put out there is um, the allowing a, a farmer to put uh, a solar array on their on a piece of their property could actually save the farm, not buy the farm, actually save the farm, uh, and then help struggling farmers, uh, you know, make a, make make a make a learning a, a living wage off of the farming instead of having to have augmented kind of uh, um, uh, income if, if that's what their family has to do. Uh, and I think, I think that's something that really needs to be looked at as well. Uh, and I would like to hear feedback, you know, um, about that. I'm open to feedback uh, from the farming community on that for sure. Uh, I, I come um, from both lines of uh, both sides of my family. I come from uh, decades and decades and, and generations of farmers. So um, I, I get that. Uh, the other thing I wanted, the if last I thing I'll bring please, up. If I could please interrupt. We only have, we just found, I just found out, we only have till 8.15 tonight. So I'm going to ask everyone to please keep their remarks to around three minutes so we can hear from as many people as possible. We're going to have other meetings. I don't mean to cut anyone off, but you understand their, my concern. Sure, so, go ahead. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, please, please keep in contact with us. Susan, if you could please, we'll yes. try to keep people to three minutes. Yes, Caroline Taylor, um, it is your turn. You may turn your video on and begin. Right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to, um, thank you to Council President Katz and to Council Member Reamer and the other council members for this additional conversation. I'd like to echo uh, the thanks that came from Jeremy and Randy um, Stabler for the opportunity to weigh in further. I'm looking forward to the conversation with uh, full stake with a group of stakeholders to see how we can make solar work well in the reserve uh, without jeopardizing key functions, key, key um, goals of the reserve, notably a strong and resilient local food system uh, and a healthy uh, environment with uh, biodiversity as a key uh, element of that. Um, I'm going to share good news and be very brief. Um, uh, in our land link program, we have 40 uh, new and expanding farmers who are seeking acreage in the reserve to grow the food that ends up on our tables, 
uh, the fiber that ends up uh, in uh, clothing, that's natural fibrous uh, wool. Um, and um, we are seeking to pair them with landowners. Um, to state the obvious, uh, additional competition for the acreage that they need uh, to farm on uh, at raising the price per acre is going to be a real difficult challenge for us to be able to connect those farmers. And these farmers are actually some of them new farmers to the area. These are immigrants coming to us from African nations. I have just added an Indian family uh, seeking to grow here. And so I just want to be clear that from where we're coming from, we want to find out how to accommodate solar without jeopardizing uh, the key, the central goal of the reserve. And I believe the conversations that uh, Council President Katz has recommended uh, with his good and optimistic view that we can come to a place uh, with suggestions such as Jeremy's, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can do uh, well uh, by uh, how we accommodate solar uh, within the reserve and elsewhere in the county. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Our next speaker is Doug Boucher. Hi. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time and because Council President Katz specifically asked us to give every suggestion we have, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to go into it uh, uh, very quickly. I think we want to have suggestions for compromises. The Council certainly indicated that that's what they wanted. And although... Just compromises until the very end, so it's the time to do that. So let me mention just a couple of possibilities. Uh, the idea of phasing this in that Jeremy mentioned, I think, is a good one. Um, I think we could do it a third, a third, a third. The the only thing I would say is the climate problem is urgent, and we really have to have, you know, two year or one year phases rather than thinking about five years and having this stretch out over 15 years. That's that's just totally unreasonable in terms of the urgency of the climate problem. But two years, two years, two years, I think is quite reasonable. Um, a second thing I've heard is that uh, opponents have said that the uh, uh, community solar is not specifically mentioned or required in the ZTA. That certainly could be a good compromise. Um, and we could carve out a certain portion of additional land that is only available for community solar. For example, we could add 300 acres or 500 acres to the 1800 and say that's only for community solar. Uh, so that's another possibility. Uh, we could use the additional tax revenue that comes from solar projects uh, to benefit uh, the up county. And there's several ways of doing that. It could go into agricultural preservation um, it could go into programs like the land link uh, program that uh, Carolyn just mentioned. Um, it could go for better social services. This is something that the Fair Access Campaign here in the Up County has been pushing for uh, for years. Uh, we have very poor social services in, in, in our region. It could go into the better transportation, uh, particularly clean transportation. For example, uh, extend uh, uh, ride on services. Uh, using electric vehicles uh, into our, our our region. It could go into bit, better internet, uh, which I certainly am one of the people in the up county who was suffering from the, the poor broadband that we have up here. Uh, we could make available broadband for the whole of the uh, uh, county, not just uh, people in the concentrated concentrations down county. And then it could go into actually making the agricultural reserve serve the needs of food security. Right now, less than 1% of our food comes from the agricultural reserve. The products of the agricultural reserve are commodity crops overwhelmingly, uh, corn, soy, wheat, uh, pasture land, uh, hay gotcha. production. Uh, much of it isn't producing food at all. It Mr. Gotcha, my apologies. Production, for example, or the landscape. Mr. Boucher, my apologies. We've got you at a little over three minutes. So yes. um, thank you so much for your comments. Okay, very good, thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Corey Ramsden. Mr. Ramsden? 
Hi, thank you very much, um, Corey Ramston from Seoul United Neighbors. Thanks very much to Council President Katz and Council Member Reamer and all the rest of the council members for hosting this. We really appreciate it. Uh, I promise to keep an eye on the clock here. I just wanted to, to say we're, we've been working in the county for a number of years now. I was the program director in 2015. And uh, since then we've um, helped several hundred people go solar on the rooftop. I'm a solar owner myself. And uh, we obviously feel pretty strongly about community solar as a way to address some of the equity of access issues that uh, we see in the state that others have spoken about. So that's sort of why we care about community solar. But uh, I just wanted to, to sort of reinforce, I think, what some others have said. And we just to state that we really um, we see this ZTA and the work the county is doing really as a great opportunity um, for being able to lead in the state in this in this regard. Um, we think that solar should be encouraged all over the county on rooftops, on carports, on developed lands. Certainly no argument there. We, we highly encourage incentivizing that, especially where it's difficult. Um, we also heard from Dr. Bartlett and others that uh, this is really a both and approach, right? We, 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 we need to be doing everything sort of at the same time and try to make that work as, as best we can. Uh, and as I mentioned a second ago, we think this is a great opportunity for the county to lead in a state in the state and really design a regulation that successfully supports um, the surrounding agricultural community. So my question really there is, is what can we do to bring the ZTA to a place where it does this? And I think it's got a, a lot of those components now and where the farming community is, is in support. And one thing that Carolyn Taylor said a minute ago, which I really think is, uh, is wonderful, is the land link program. There might, there's probably ways where we can have these things be harmonized. And just to give you an example, we're a member of the Solar Grazing Association American Solar Grazing Association. So I listen to a lot of these uh, presentations uh, and it's working in other places, right? Solar grazing, just as one example, is a viable option for, for land maintenance underneath arrays. And it pays you know, roughly about 600 acres, uh, $600 per acre per year from what we've, you know, what we've seen, it probably varies. Is there a way where we can combine that type of, of benefit with a, a land link program potentially just as one suggestion where we're sort of uh, playing matchmaker so that uh, land that's available can actually support new farmers and people who want to build that kind of business. So looking forward to participating and coming up with other solutions so that we can really find something that everyone uh, feels is a, is, a, is a positive and builds solar and helps the county and meets its renewable goals and the state's goals. So thanks again for your, for your time. Thank you. Susan, can I just, I just want to say through the course of these meetings, anyone who has a suggestion we want you to send them to us and they will go into a report that will go to the county council as part of the report of this entire process. So every idea will be recorded. At the same time, we are going to be seeing if we can bring people together and find some common ground. So there's two parallel paths here. Every idea we want, and then we're also going to see if there is common ground more directly. So just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thumbs up. Good, good point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bob Sissel um, is the next speaker. Mr. Sissel, you may start your video and, and begin. Hi, uh, I, I'm going to try to lose, use less than three minutes so that I, other people can speak. Uh, I've been working with Hans and Sydney and, and everyone on this for a long, long time. Uh, I'm the director of MAP, Montgomery Agricultural Producers. I'd like to thank uh, the council president and, and councilman uh, Reamer for uh, allowing this process to continue to move forward and making sure that all voices are heard and, and the discussion continues. Um, we look, uh, I must say that at this point, uh, the, the, we stand with, uh, as Jeremy, Chris had said, the, the, at the Office of Agriculture, the agricultural community still stands against the CTA but we do look forward to um, continuing the discussion with the work group moving forward um, and being able to have input in, into that discussion. Um, but, but again, I, I, I do appreciate the opportunity that we have uh, tonight to, to um, get the input that's coming in. And um, I'm here, as you guys always know, and, and open to the discussion. Uh, again, Sydney, I wanna thank you very much for, for moving this forward. And, uh, and Hans and your support in making sure that we are uh, people in the ag community whose livelihood depends on, on, on farming um, ha has a voice. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank God. I recognize you even with the beard. I did. <laughs> this is my COVID beard. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm chasing after Hans. <laughs> there, oh, there, oh, there you go. Mine's a little grayer, though. <laughs> I'm going to join you in that deer stand, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Sissel. Our next speaker is Leslie Elder. Ms. Elder, you may start your video and begin. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I would also like to thank the council president and other members for allowing CCSA to speak. And we really appreciate uh, the structure that you're setting up and the ability to participate in it. Uh, so my name is Leslie Elder and I'm the Mid-Atlantic Director for the Coalition for Community Solar Access. I oversee community solar markets in Maryland, New Jersey, Virginia, and soon in Pennsylvania. Uh, CCSA is a national coalition of businesses and nonprofits. Uh, we really work together to implement best practices for all community solar markets in the United States. Um, our mission is really to empower all Maryland households and businesses to seek homegrown energy sources through community solar. Uh, we do this by working with customers, utilities, local stakeholders like this meeting, uh, and policymakers to develop and implement best practices that ensure community solar programs provide a win-win-win solution. Uh, and we are really looking forward to participating in this venue too. Uh, we do have members headquartered in Maryland um, and also some in Montgomery County, uh, while we also have others that are interested in, in investing in the, in the county. Currently, nearly 75% of American households and businesses cannot access clean and renewable energy because of common barriers, like they rent, they live in multi-tenant buildings, they have physical barriers to hosting, or there's financial constraints preventing them from owning their own solar system. Um, so community solar really is the solution that allows any person or business who pays an electric bill equal access to the economic and environmental benefits of, of solar energy without the need to install a solar system on site. Um, so Montgomery County has chosen to be a leader in Maryland through the adoption of an energy plan that exceeds the state's clean energy goals, and uh, thank you for doing that. Um, under the ZTA, the community solar will power uh, 54,000 homes, create jobs, and provide stable income for landowners and farmers. Additionally, community solar will provide economic benefits to the county through job creation and increased tax revenue. Um, it's estimated that community solar could provide over 1.8 million dollars in economic benefits to the county over the next seven to eight years uh, with the passage of, of the ZTA. Um, and this, this can all be spent on the things that uh, Mr. Butcher previously discussed. So as a farm owner myself, I can really appreciate the concerns the agricultural community and landowners have about solar development in the Ag Reserve. A CCSA and I in particular appreciate these concerns and remain committed to the regulations and restrictions to prevent overdevelopment in the agricultural reserve that are currently present both in state law and the ZTA. Uh, we are currently working with the State Farm Bureau in Maryland to incorporate community solar in their platform and find solutions for community solar development with agricultural development. Uh, we have also successfully worked with Farm Bureaus all over the country, uh, and I work with them in every state that I, that I oversee. Uh, so the ZTA has significant limitations uh, built into the legislation as well as additional restrictions uh, by the pilot program that is regulated by the state. I won't go into it because Franny already brief, uh, beautifully discussed this. Ms. Elder, uh, it's, we're, we're at a little over three minutes, so I'm okay. going to have to ask you to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mike Tidwell. I see he's in the attendees um, in the attendees line over there, so maybe the engineers can get him moved into panelists so he can ask his question. And while that's happening, we'll go to Gary Skolnick. All right. Th thank you, uh, uh, Council President Katz and, and uh, Council Member Reamer and all the others for this opportunity to speak. My name is Gary Skolnick. I'm the CEO of Neighborhood Sun. We are a uh, Montgomery County based uh, community solar company uh, headquartered in Silver Spring. Uh, I'm a longtime Montgomery County resident and we are in favor of this, uh, of the ZTA. Uh, we've heard a lot of, about uh, solar development, but I wanted to just speak about one other aspect of it uh, in community solar, and that is that um, we've helped over 4,000 Marylanders subscribe to community solar projects 
And the amazing thing about it is that anybody who pays an electric bill can subscribe. It's not just for uh, people who are wealthy enough to put solar panels on their house. And um, with that, uh, a lot of our uh, subscribers are actually low and moderate income uh, residents. And I want to talk about two projects very briefly. We have in the Potomac Edison Utility Territory, which is the territory where most of the Ag Reserve is. Uh, these two projects have subscribed about 1,000 customers, of whom 40% are low or moderate income Marylanders. Um, these are people at right above the fe federal poverty level or uh, below the uh, average household income. And they have saved between 20 and 30% on their energy costs uh, because of community solar. So we are putting uh, uh, two, three, four hundred dollars a year into the pockets of low and moderate income Marylanders um, who need the money, frankly. And so let's not forget about that side of, of solar development. You've got the developers who build the projects. They do uh, uh, bring economic development. You also have the subscribers who need uh, every penny to help with their family budget. Um, so for that reason, we ask you to support this. Thank you very much. I see we have Mr. Tidwell. So Mr. Tidwell, you may begin. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I uh, want to join others in, in thanking uh, the council for taking this issue so seriously. Uh, we've had lots of debate. I want to especially thank Hans and uh, Tom Hucker for being leaders on this. Um, I am Mike Tidwell. I'm director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. We have about 5,000 members in Montgomery County. I've lived in Montgomery County for almost 32 years. It's a great progressive county, great progressive council. I've really enjoyed working with the council over the years on multiple environmental issues. But I just want to say on this issue, I, as a voter, am just really frustrated uh, by the process. I think the committee did a great job. I think the committee's work was fantastic in finding lots of compromises. I think the the, the, the bill that was passed out of committee is a great compromise bill ready to be voted on by the council. Uh, it caps acreage, it's community solar, uh, room for pollinator friendly, uh, no class one soils, et cetera. I think it's a great bill as it is, and I'm frustrated that uh, uh, President Katz, it, that this is not coming forward for a vote now. Uh, I think January is too long. We're running out of time on Climate change, you yourselves, the council, in December 2017, over three years ago, almost three years ago, voted that there was a climate emergency in this country, in this council, and set fantastic emissions reduction uh, uh, goals. And at this point, I've seen nothing super concrete come from the council in three years. This is concrete. This is real. You've got an impact from lots of uh, input from lots of folks. Uh, uh, compromises have been made. It's ready to go now. Uh, I am afraid that farmland in our in our county will be economically unproductive soon because of climate change, because of extreme flooding, extreme droughts. And if you want to make that land productive, we've got to let the farmland harvest solar as well as beans and soybeans, uh, so, uh, cr uh, corn and soybeans. So uh, I'm frustrated as a as a voter. Uh, our the vast majority of our 5,000 members are frustrated and, and would like you to vote. Uh, and um, it, this is just starting to look like a political failure on the part of the council. I hate to be blunt. I've worked with the council on a lot of issues. Um, and so I want to compliment the committee again, the great work that I think has already been done. Uh, given that we're going to have apparently continued uh, dysfunction in Congress, it's up to localities, the counties and municipalities and states to take action. I think our council is ready to take action or should be ready to take action on a bill that's already been uh, uh, put in good shape. So uh, I hope that you will go forward with this now, uh, not in January, not a year from now, not three years from now. Uh, we need to start making good on this climate declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three minutes on the nose. So that was very good. Lauren Greenberger, you're next. Please unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. There you click, go. Click the wrong mute button. Um, 
So um, I am, uh, most of you know me, I'm president of Sugarloaf Citizens Association and I represent citizens who are um, in the farming community here in the Agricultural Reserve. Um, the first thing I just wanna say is this, this is supposed to be a town hall meeting and I have heard from half of the people who have come are not members of this community. They're not the people that President Katz said had not been heard. Um, most of the people we've heard from already are part of the solar industry and, and supporting that. And I've, I've had two farmers speak, I think, but I don't, I see there are 60 questions in the, in the chat. And I don't know if any of those people are going to have a chance to speak. So I'm just a little frustrated by this being a town hall, which isn't really a town hall. And even me, I mean, I'm a, I'm the president of an organization here. Um, this should be this should be the community having a chance to talk, and and I don't see that. I see people who have an agenda of their own, and they're and they're being given um, a, a voice. Um, it was only two days ago that I heard about this. Um, I mean, I knew it was coming up a, a week ago um, in the middle of the election, and then two days we were given. I had I called to see if there was something some way we could we could sign up and that's the only time I learned. So I hate to take my time up doing this, but I, I'm, I'm frustrated by the process because it doesn't feel that this is really a community activity. Um, I wanna make a couple of comments about things that people have said, um, talking about how this is, this is already a great bill. Um, there's a lot of assumptions here that aren't necessarily accurate and I think we need to look at those. Um, Al Bartlett said there's no land available in the county. We have 33,000 acres of land that has been identified that is degraded or parking lots or you know land that is not viable agri agricultural land and that land has the potential for having solar on it. So to say there's nothing in the county that can be used, I disagree and, and I think um, Councilmember Hucker said at the last meeting that we had passed a, a, a legislation that allowed solar to be in the rest of the county, and no one was no one was taking it up. Well, maybe that means, as as President Katz said, we need to incentivize that. We need to get businesses incentivized. We need to we need to subsidize, maybe do a tax incentive. When you look at what Germany has done in incentives they have practically gone all renewable energy because they have incentivized their population. So we don't have to take up our farmland that we will need for food production in the coming couple of decades. And for Mike Tidwell to say that this land is, we are not gonna be able to farm it in the near future, that's probably not accurate. This is one of the few places in the country that will still have water when other places dry up. And those, that farmland that we have here, we're gonna need for, for agriculture. And we, we may be growing corn and soybeans on it, but guess what those do? They feed animals that we eat also. Ms. Greenberger, I'm sorry. We're at about three and a half minutes. I have to have you wrap up. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker is David Blockstein. Mr. Blockstein, uh, if you could show your video to us and begin. You blocked my video because uh, I had it on before. If you could unblock it, I hope. Oh, okay. Well, they can hopefully they can turn it on for you. You can go ahead and start. Sir. Okay, I'll, I'll speak. There you are. Great. So, thank you very much for your time. I'm David Blackstein. I'm the, uh, have a doctorate in ecology and uh, live in Tacoma Park. I'm a member of the county's uh, clean energy working group, and uh, you've all heard from me before, and I appreciate the opportunity um, to hear to be heard again. So I guess one of the, the points that I've said in the past is that um, this process should be integrated with the uh, um, Climate Action and Resilience Plan that is uh, being developed. And the good news is that uh, the process has continued to the point where we're now just weeks away from the uh, draft uh, plan to be released by the consultants. And so I hope that uh, this um, ZTA proposal is looked at in the context of something that's going to be much more comprehensive and will help us to, to look at the trade-offs. 
I want to, I did submit some questions in advance, but I want to share an insight in listening to this and listening to the discussion. It's an insight that I got hearing a talk by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's a Native American doctorate in ecology and botanist. And I think we're, it's all comes to land, but we're looking at land in two different ways. Some of the people here, especially the developers, and I'm a customer of Gary's, that we have community solar, are looking at the land as a location, as a substrate for what we're calling the ground-based solar. And I don't think anybody here is opposed to solar energy. But there's another way of looking at the land, and that's in the way that I think a lot of the people who live there, who live in the agricultural reserve, look at it. And that's in the way that Alda Leopold described it, as land, as a biotic community, something that we're a part of and that is a living entity. And it's not just a place where you put technology or whatever else. And I think we're really, we have these two different worldviews that are being represented here. And so, you know, people have talked about compromise. Well, until you understand each other's worldviews, the compromise is not necessarily where you're going to go with this. And so I guess I urge people to think about these different worldviews and to look in the systems perspective that I hope we're going to get with the draft plan that will be coming out in a few weeks. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Blackstein. Next up, we have Doug Lechleiter. Mr. Lechleiter, you can begin your statement. As said, my name is Doug Lechleiter. I am a lifelong property owner and farmer here in Montgomery County. And I do want to thank the council for slowing this down a little bit and having some more conversation. I'm currently chairman of the Ag Advisory Committee, and I can affirm, as some other ag representatives have said, that I've never seen the unity that I've seen in the ag community. And it's all opposed to this SOLWARS ETA. Very surprising to me to see the unity there. My concern and what I've heard from other people is I saw in Councilman Reamer's letter back to me, a resident letter, that it stated that Montgomery County's share of the solar will likely be 2,500 megawatts. And producing 2,500 megawatts will require between 12,500 and 20,000 acres of solar arrays. So in light of this number that's been publicized, 12,000 to 20,000, we're talking about 1,800. And I think it's a lot of concern in the ag community that that's just a beginning. Obviously, there will have to be further properties. The other thing is that I think it would go a long ways. I know we've had a lot of conversation about it doesn't work on parking lots and it doesn't work on rooftops. I don't think I agree with that, or maybe it's not practical. But I think, you know, if some of the farm community saw some skin in the game down county where the electricity is needed, I think that would go a long way to help with this conversation also. It just takes so much acreage, it sounds like, in this conversation. I've learned a lot. But when you talk about this type of acreage, we may be very warm in the winter and very cool in the summer, but we may have nowhere to grow food. I know it's been stated that the Ag Reserve does not really grow food for people, but those crops go into chickens and it goes into beef and pork, and a lot of people eat that. So I disagree with that, but I do appreciate the opportunity to have this thing slowed down so my other opinions heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lechleiter. Our next speaker is Margaret Chasson. 
Ms. Chasson, you can turn on your, vi your video and begin. Are you there, Ms. Chasson? Maybe she can't turn it on. We do, as was mentioned, have a lot of questions that have come in. And um, as I said earlier, we will be saving all those questions. And, and folks, we will get back to you. I'm going to read a couple of the statements that have come in and also a question. Um, this is from Jeanette Kaufman. She says, my question is really a statement. I would ask that we wait before we proceed so we can look for innovative solutions. This could be putting solar along roadway rights of way, using microwave transmission towers, and creative other innovative solutions. It is important to avoid using the agricultural reserve that was created for a very specific reason. Then from Roseanne Skirbel, how can it be assured that if and when a solar project advances on the ag reserve that other solar and otherwise and others will not follow the ag reserve is a gem that must be preserved for us and for future generations our next question or statement whatever it might be will be from woody woodruff mr woodruff you can unmute and begin oh that's exciting uh great to see you all um, I'll be brief and uh, I'll pass with the pleasantries. Um, I do have two ideas. Those of you that know me, I, I'm a, I've got a lot of ideas. Uh, so take it or leave it. Um, in terms of moving, I would love to see solar happening on a larger scale. I really would, but I think there's some compromises that could take place. When we built a project on parkland, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, there was a tree and it had a critical root zone uh, known as a CRZ. And we needed to impact that critical root zone by a certain percentage. Uh, and it was allowed uh, to, to do that up to 20%. So um, I'm concerned about, uh, I think that we need to limit it into the, you know, Jeremy Chris's knows the details, but the class, whatever, soils. Uh, but I think that if you're going to have continuous, you know, you can't just plop a rectangle down uh, on soil. It's It's got contours. So you might have to impact uh, some of these class one, two, three soils, uh, but you can have a, a rule that allows you to impact up to a certain percentage, like in the example of the critical root zone of a, a tree. Uh, the second idea is that, um, as someone said earlier, I'd like to see the county put some skin in the game. Um, when we built here, we triggered a reforestation um, requirement, and we needed to build, we needed to plant trees. So if you're going to put 1,800 acres into solar, impervious surface, and uh, by the way, um, pollinator-friendly uh, underneath solar and agrivoltaics and all that, you need to provide for the maintenance of those. You can't just plant it and leave it alone. It doesn't work that way, uh, speaking as a farmer. Um, but I would love to see uh, a, a solar project, if it's going to be implemented, it triggers um, the county needing to pay for a consult, pay for somebody like Rupert Nurseries or somebody like that, not park and planning, uh, to plant trees uh, in, in, in some fashion that would be uh, equal to what the impact is. And I'll let you guys in the Fed Committee work that, that out with your consultants. Um, and that's, uh, I've hit it. That's it. How did I do, Susan? Two minutes and 38 seconds. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. Thank you very much, Mr. Woodruff. Uh, Denise Katara uh, had her hand up for a question, and we brought her in to ask her question. Ms. Katara, you may start your video and unmute and go ahead and begin. Hello and good evening. Um, thank you so much, Council 
President Katz and all the other council members. My name is Denise Guitarra. I am the Maryland Conservation Advocate for Audubon and Naturalist Society. Uh, as you may know, we've been around 123 years and our mission is to inspire DC area residents to enjoy, learn about and protect nature. And um, I'm here tonight because I have some um, comments. Uh, you might have seen that I dropped our, our joint uh, AMS and Clean Water Action uh, testimony that we submitted to council, but I can definitely forward um, the testimony again. But I want to make a point of two things that I've seen um, through tonight's conversation that came up. And one is that um, we um, we are very supportive of prioritizing putting um, solar in disturbed lands such as brownfields, parking garages, utility corridors, rooftops, and um, county-owned facilities. And also of doing a solar study, uh, solar siting study like New Jersey and Massachusetts have done already. Which they, where they have established a solar rubric to help policymakers uh, plan for solar siting. So we're asking to plan ahead for uh, smart solar in the county. And um, the other th two points I want to make is that um, so right now, the, the way that the ZTA stands, uh, we're just protecting class one soils, um, but most of the prime agricultural land is actually found in, in soils type two and three. So um, that's why a solar study will help us to find out exactly where and which of these other um, soil class types can we prioritize and we can and cannot put solar panels as to not conflict with the agricultural uses. And then going on the last point is the uh, pollinator friendly. Um, actually, so our, our partners Clean Water Action um, Network, they found out that the pollinator uh, friendly uh, requirements are a little bit worrisome because um, apparently there is a provision um, that allows pest pesticides to be used still um, and that the uh, Central Miller Maryland beekeepers and the Maryland Pesticide Education Network uh, have previously raised these existing state standard that allows for pesticides to be used. So maybe that's something, a point to be uh, further looked into to make sure that if that's the case for the state standards so that we might uh, have to ensure that uh, new pesticides are applied to the pollinator friendly plants that are going to be installed under the solar panels. And uh, one last point, uh, which I, I recently found out actually, is that um, there's these things called um, solar robotics. So it's a way to um, basically install less solar panels in one given area. And um, I know that because of impervious surfaces, um, and, and Susan's going to cut me off, but that's all I had. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Denise. I appreciate it. We have time for one more question, and that person or comment that will only be about two minutes, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. So, Alfred Werglitz, we're going to let you go ahead, and you have two minutes, sir, to uh, tell us what you're thinking. So, go ahead and begin. You're muted, sir, so if you could unmute yourself, please. There you go. How's that? Okay. Great. Thank, thank you, Council President uh, Katz and Council Member Reamer for uh, this opportunity to, uh, to uh, add some ideas to the, uh, to the mix here. Um, I, I, I heard someone refer to 33,000 acres that are potentially uh, solar sites uh, in the county that are not, uh, that are not agricultural, uh, part of the agricultural reserve. Uh, but uh, thinking about that leads me to think about, well, what's really driving, uh, you know, putting solar in the ag reserve? And I think what's putting it, driving that is that uh, the county made a decision to make it an ag reserve and the, the value of the land is artificially depressed. Uh, and therefore the leasing opportunities there for solar industry uh, are, are uh, greater than they are, you know, on other sites. And, you know, speaking as a business person, I would simply say that means that uh, there's more profit to be made and there's nothing wrong with making profit. But uh, b before we do this with the Ag Reserve, I think the county ought to think about um, that's a public good. The county ought to think about do we want to give that public good to the solar industry 
or does the county should the county consider doing something along the lines of what it did in the old National Geographic site where it put solar over the parking lot or where County Parks Department uh, put I, I think they have two uh, two sites where they did uh, solar substantial solar uh, and and maybe consider doing that in either a public private context where the county uh, optimally does the site selection and figures out where the best place is for it to be cited that will have the lowest impact on wherever it goes, but in particular in the ag reserve, or if, if not a public private, maybe just a, um, you know, federally funded research and development center thing where you hire a nonprofit to uh, develop something and run something to the county specifications so that we maybe get that a fuller uh, value of that public good for the county rather than uh, letting the solar, uh, you know, the private sector for-profit solar industry take that public good. So okay. I don't know if that's been considered at all as yet, but I think uh, if we're gonna consider the Ag Reserve or we're gonna consider any other uh, county uh, controlled or county influenced sites around the country, around the county, that we ought to, we've got some experience at the county level in solar installations apparently. I think we ought to give some consideration to that. And I Thank don't you, know Mr. If Wergles. Anybody has done so at this point. Thank you Thank so you. much. I'm going to toss it back to Council President Katz and Council Member Reamer to wrap it up. Go ahead, Hans. Thank you. Um, Thank you for all of the comments and, and feedback. I know far more people would like to be able to speak than we're able to accommodate, you know, at, at any one time. We will have a record of all the Q&A and that will go, we will compile a report from all of our meetings that will go in the package that will go to the council uh, when we return to this at the full council. And um, again, ask for anyone to send their ideas and, and recommendations to us uh, for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, there again, I uh, Hans is certainly correct. That is what we're going to be doing and we're gonna be uh, pleased to be doing that. I wanna thank everyone for being here this evening. Uh, we probably should have started the three minute rule a little sooner, but this is a live and learn for us as well. But we want to come up with the best solution we can come up with. I understand there are people that would have liked this done yesterday. There are some people that wouldn't want this, don't want this to be done here at all. And there's gotta be a blending of between the two thoughts. So we will, we will uh, get back as quickly as we can. We'll give as much notice as we can for the next steps and, and the work groups and every everything else associated with it. Hopefully you met a new friend this evening and you'll chat it out and, uh, and, and with your ideas as well so that we get more and more of those good ideas. So thank you very much. And thank you, Susan Kennedy, for, for, uh, for being the moderator and doing a wonderful job as well. So thank you. And I thank all my colleagues for being here. Uh, and with that, I guess we can say good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, what do you want to say to them and the residents in the 